Right, so, over to Caitlin. Do you guys want to sit? So I'm not nearly as funny as Brendan, I'm really sorry. Um, <laughs> here. So I, I never give talks with notes, but I'm going to do it this time, because this is a little bit uh, last minute, and I'm not exactly a historian, so let's put this on as well. Um, so, <laughs> so the thing about Falmouth is that if you Google it, you can get some information. <laughs> Let's make it really embarrassing for our people. Let's make it really embarrassing for them arriving late. Melting. 
And most people think that the glaciers that happened during the ice ages did not extend all the way down into Cornwall. Although some people argue that and say actually we did have some sheets of ice that covered from this area all the way out to the Isles of Scilly so that people could have walked back and forth if they wanted. But the point is, regardless of where exactly the ice was, there was a lot of it. And England at this time was clearly no longer the tropical paradise that it had been below the equator. So it was really cold, it was pretty much a tundra the way that Russia is a tundra now, or Siberia. And this caused everything to be much more exposed than, uh, than previously, because the land had been pushed up, and then the water had been frozen in the ice, and so you've got all this area now that no longer has ocean on it. And in fact, people think that probably the oceans were about 100 meters away. The shorelines were 100 meters away from where they are today. And so this was you know, quite a different habitat than what we see today. And what's really important is the fact that in between all of these uh, moments of being frozen and moments of being thawed, you have all this activity of the water. And because of the way that all of the geological activity happened, the UK was kind of on a slope. So for about 120 kilometers or so, you had the south uh, portion of the whole country sloping down into the sea. And when you've got slope, then you've got water running off. So every time you had ice sheets melting, all of that water would trickle down and then aggregate so you've got more and more. And by the time it reached Cornwall, you had these huge waterfalls basically just rushing through the rivers, scouring out the valleys, carrying down those granite boulders that had been thrust up and broken off. And all that, all those broken off bits are called head. And so all that head that you see in the region now was pushed down by the glacier, glacial water moving down and creating these huge valleys and all these little fingers of land and this massive runoff. And the last one of these runoff things happened about 15,000 years ago. And when that happened, all of that water that had been tied up in the ice suddenly was down here in the ocean. And all of those valleys that had been created by all the <coughs> runoff were suddenly filled up again. And this created something called rias. And this area is absolutely full of rias. And that's what's shown here. Um, so all these little things right here, all these little tributaries of the estuary that we're in right now. There are major, six major ones of them, but also 28 little rivers and creeks. All of these would have been valleys back in this time that had been scoured out by all that glacial activity. And then when the water level rose, suddenly they were filled in as well. And this was extremely important for what we became because all of that activity caused these valleys and channels to be extremely deep. Some of them as deep as 34 meters. Now some of them are also quite shallow, so if you go to the King Harry Ferry, it's only about five meters deep. And some of the shelves are also quite shallow. But right in the middle of the channel, it's extremely deep. And that's very important for all of the maritime activity that we have here, the sailing, the big ships. Also, it creates an environment that's good for particular species of animals. So these are sardines or pilchard, and Cornwall is really famous for these. And these guys like to stay at depth during the day, so up to 100 meters. Uh, but at least as low as 25 meters. And then at night they come up and they feed. And so the habitat that we have to offer them is exactly what they want. It's nice and deep, but then they can come up whenever they want to eat the little microvertebrates <coughs> at the top of the ocean. And so all of this was setting us up to be the perfect environment for the sorts of things that we do here today. And the reason I'm emphasizing all of this geological stuff and historical stuff is that Really, any, you know, people can live in any habitat, but they're going to be attracted to particular habitats because of the resources that they have to offer. And these are the resources that Falmouth has to offer. <coughs> and you'll notice that I have now kind of switched a little bit into talking about Falmouth in particular. But unfortunately, the kind of human historical record is a bit thin. Uh, and so there are some things where I can say something about what's happening locally, but other things where I have to be quite general and just talk about Cornwall. Uh, I will also note that this area that I'm showing here on the map is known as Carrick Roads, which you've probably already heard of. So this whole area right here. And Carrick Roads is actually not a phrase that came into being really until the 16th century. And it comes from a, a Cornish term, supposedly, um, that means seal rock. So Carrick Run, more or less. I'm not actually sure how to pronounce that. But we call this what we call it now because of that rock out in the middle of uh, the, the mouth of the bay where the seals all sun themselves and lounge whenever the water is low. So people would have been around all that time when we had the ice sheets. They would have come up whenever it was thawing and then gone back down to Europe whenever it was not. Uh, and these were the 
potentially Paleolithic people, but definitely Mesolithic people, some all the way up to about 8,000 years ago. And we have very, very little record of these guys in Cornwall at all, but we do know that they were likely here. And actually, one of the very few finds of artifacts from this time is from um, the Penren River area, actually. So they were doing some digging there, and they found these really, really ancient tools from these guys. So we do know that uh, these people were around in this area to at least some extent. We think that they probably were surviving on fish and veg at that point, probably doing some hunting as well. So they were just very early people that would have wandered about utilizing resources wherever they could find them. And at some point, between five and 6,000 years ago, a final flooding event occurred so that England actually became, uh, well, all of the UK became the island that it is today. So at that point, that's when we really start to have the first um, Brits, if you like. Now, going forward in time in, in the Neolithic period, this is a lot of the stuff that you'll probably have seen if you've done any kind of tourism here in Cornwall. So all the stone stuff, that started back in the Neolithic era, when you've got people who are settling for the first time, forming organized societies, and taking um, all of these stones from around the area and arranging them into significant patterns. You've got stone circles, you've got burial sites, uh, you've got various other arrangements, some of them pot uh, potentially having to do with astronomy, so you do have the formation of, of real societies at this point. There's also some animal domestication and uh, early agriculture. And these are probably things that they were learning from people who were in Europe, coming in in waves of settlers, um, somehow making it over the, the gap of water, and then passing on those techniques. Because both domestication and agriculture arose in uh, the far eastern portion of Europe and the Middle East. So they transfer that information across. And this is the time at which the woodlands really started to be cleared here in Cornwall. Now, trees have never grown particularly well in this area, uh, but there were some at some point, especially when it was warmer than it is today. And this is the time when people really start getting rid of the last of the major forests that we had in this area. Now, in the Bronze Age, this is when you know Cornwall really <coughs> starts to come into its own. And there is some evidence. Sorry, things are going off over here. Um, there is some evidence of tin working, and of course, <coughs> you need to have tin before you can have bronze, because bronze is copper and tin, and so you have people at this time really figuring out how to get these metals from those big veins that I was talking about. They're getting them out of the land, figuring out how to work, work them, make those into bronze, and then use those tools themselves and also trade further abroad. We also have a huge agricultural boom. And people actually think that agriculture has been going on here in Cornwall probably longer than anywhere else in the UK. Um, and so this is something that has been a huge part of this area for quite a long time. And in fact, this area of Cornwall, of the UK, sorry, has done so well that some people have thought that it's perhaps <coughs> the one that was most advanced of all the areas of the UK at that time. Um, obviously it wasn't the UK, but I don't really know what else to call it. But we were extremely fertile, there was all this metal, there was all this land for agriculture, and so we probably were doing better than anyone else in the area. And this is great because a lot of it does go back to the sorts of things that we're doing even now. And it's that access to the coastline and the ability to not only have products locally, but give them to someone else from abroad and also bring in stuff that those people might have to offer. So for example, we know that the Cornish um, traded with the Phoenicians. So you had people coming from clear over in the Mediterranean, making really long journeys just to get the tin that the Cornish had to offer. Now in the Iron Age, this is a time where people are starting to actually revise what we think about this period, so all of this is a bit in flux. But the idea is that throughout most of the country you had lots of invaders and lots of raids, and time, um, th this was a time when it was not easy to be around. And there were hill forts that were built up, presumably to protect people from these raiders. But actually, there's a lot of research here that suggests that Cornwall is doing really well at this time, and it's actually quite peaceful. And some people have suggested that the hill forts are actually just to keep in um, livestock so they don't go wandering off, so your neighbors don't come in and rustle them, so you can kind of uh, impress the town next to you that you're built up more than they are, but nothing really actually aggressive. And what's really interesting is that in addition to these hill forts, we have these courtyard-style houses being built in Cornwall. And the fact that you've got a house that's quite open and involves lots of nature and, and coming and going suggests that it was a very peaceful place to live. There was not war going on in this area. 
And again, this is quite hard to interpret this evidence because it's very old. But there is a lot of um, there is a lot of evidence that actually Cornwall again was was sailing through this period pretty well. And this seems to be a trend that happens because we're kind of at this far left portion all by ourselves in the little tail of the country. Everything else tends to kind of pass us by, which if you want to modernize might not be so great, but if you want to stay isolated and not be impacted negatively, that's a really handy thing. Now this was the period of time when we finally do get uh, the birth of the Cornish language, which of course has since died but has gone through kind of a rebirth. More recently people are interested in, in uh, preserving that heritage. So this is the first time when you've got people referring to this area as Kurnow or Cornwall, and actually starting to become a separate and individual Cornish nation. Now, everyone who knows history of, of Europe and of England knows that in 43 AD you had a serious overthrow when the Romans came into town. But amazingly, despite the huge influence that they had on the rest of the country, Cornwall again wasn't really all that bothered. Now, People used to think that actually there was never any Roman influence here beyond Exeter. Um, they got to Exeter and they had kind of some roads that just stopped, basically. They tapered off before coming into Cornwall. However, there have been some recent finds that show that there are Roman forts in the area. Believe it or not, there is one somewhere in this picture. Um, to be honest, I cannot tell how you could possibly know that, but they have unearthed one here. Some geophys. <laughs> they found some of these sorts of things as well, a few signs that there were Romans in the area, or at least Roman-associated trading. Um, but by and large, we were left pretty unscathed by all of this down here in Cornwall, uh, except for the fact that it is the, the Romans who probably helped give us our name to some extent. Um, so the Romans trans translated Cornau into Cornovii, uh, and Cornovii were the local group of the overall Celtic region. Um, the Celtic region in this area, called they were called the Devonii, and that was both people who lived in Devon and Cornwall, and then we were kind of a separate little group. Uh, and so the Romans are thought to have kind of helped make Cornwall the name that it is today. And people argue over whether the name comes from Cornau or from Cornovii, but you can see that obviously they're quite similar. So once the Romans took off, there was kind of quite a gap here. I know I've gone from 43 to 410. But the idea is that things were kind of the same during that period until you start to have this serious spread of Christianity. And this is sometimes referred to as the Age of Saints. And this is the period right up to the invasion by William the Conqueror, when you've got all these people who have been trained in other regions of the Celtic area, so Ireland and Wales, for example. They had been trained as ministers and as monks and as whatever those people were called in that day. And they would kind of distribute across the land to spread the word of God. And a lot of them came into this region because it was quite close to where they'd been trained and because there were a lot of political ties as well. So they, Cornwall at that time had lots of little kings that were all kind of affiliated with each other. And so these guys would come and associate with the kings, and they had very good ties. And actually some of them may have become kings themselves. And we have uh, lots of Cornish saints whose names you'll find around the area. So Piran, Just, Constantine, uh, Melor, or Melor, who was then, whose name became Mylor. So all sorts of names like this. Uh, that you'll recognize from the area. So these were very important people. And very briefly, this is also the time when you had a kingdom of Cornwall. And this time is really hard to know anything about because there's so, so much mythology. And you know that's kind of pagan mythology and general mythology, but also Christian mythology, all, all together in one giant kind of confusing story. But we do know this is the time when King <coughs> Arthur, whoever that may have been, became the king of Cornwall. This is a really brief thing where you've got just one king kind of speaking for the whole country rather than all these little kings that were getting along together. Now, medieval Falmouth, this is the first time I can really start to say something about Falmouth itself. And this is a period that roughly more or less starts when William the Conqueror comes in. Now, William the Conqueror, despite having, you know, introducing quite a lot of change in the rest of the country. We had quite a light touch here in Cornwall. The major thing that he did was to give the whole area to his half-brother, uh, Robert. And this is a picture of Robert right here. And what was quite interesting about Cornwall this time, as you can see, you know, here's Anglia. So this is the area that William the Conqueror would have been king of, and his successors as well. And here's Cornwall all by itself. 
And it seems to have functioned basically the way that the UK functions now with Northern Ireland and Scotland and Wales. So these are countries that are part of that larger um, United Kingdom, but they also were separate nations allowed to make decisions for themselves. So Cornwall maintained the status for quite a long time, even though officially it had been overrun by William the Conqueror. Things were quite gentle here. It wasn't a thing of force. It just kind of happened. Um, so Robert had his holdings here. He had about 227 different estates out of the 350 in Cornwall. So he owned a substantial amount of the county. The rest of it was given to the king himself and also to the bishops, who had by that time settled down in Exeter. And the bishops, uh, as I mentioned earlier, were quite important because they were the ones who set up the college that eventually uh, came right here. So, and actually I have a picture. That's, that's Blasney College right there. Um, so this was a time when you've got, you know, I said the age of saints, but this is a time when actually you've got churches popping up. And that's important not just because it's about the spreading of Christianity, but because once you've got a church, you've got a little village that springs up around it. So in Cornwall, uh, in the era of Robert, you've suddenly got all of this kind of settling down and becoming much, much more modern. So you've got all these little towns that were popping up around these churches. And this is the time when you've got the Killigrews entering Falmouth. Now, the Killigrews were a really old Cornish family. Honestly, I couldn't find much more than that about them because really the, the good written history of them seems to start about the time that they arrived in Falmouth. And these guys were given the land that they owned here in the Falmouth area by the bishops in, what, 1264. So they came to this area right here. Arwenack, which you have probably seen at some point. So this is the house that's down next to Event Square and the little Tesco there. Um, it now is a kind of a luxury house. There are like three or four different people that live in there in little subdivisions. But it used to be a really magnificent manor. And the Killigrews lived there for about 16 generations. And the house that's there today is a rebuild because there was a fire in the 17th century. But it still remains the oldest building in all of Falmouth. And these guys were extremely powerful. They were given this land and encouraged people to uh, move into this area that was nearby where there were some settlers. And this is what we now call Prince of Wales Pier, that kind of area. It used to be called Smithwick or Pennycumquick, and those are both interpretations of old Cornish terms for the area. And there had been some fishermen that were living there because it was a nice little cove. At that time, there would have been forest that stretched from there all the way up to the moor. And so it was a nice little place for them kind of up from the marsh a little bit to go and settle and, and get their fish. And the, the Killigrews didn't kick them out. In fact, they encouraged more people to come in because they knew that if they wanted to have lots of power and to really consolidate their resources, they needed to have followers and people to do things for them. And so they're really the ones that encouraged Falmouth to, to grow and become what it is today. And the major thing that Killigrews really did, I mean, they were involved in government and and business and all sorts of trade, but really what they had their hand in that made them all the money that they had was piracy. And piracy is a big thing throughout all of Cornwall. So not just pirating, but also smuggling and privateering and wrecking and all sorts of naughty things that people were doing along the coast to get stuff that belonged to someone else. This had been going on for pretty much as long as there were people here and there were boats offshore that they could go plunder. And it's a perfect place for that because if you think of all those little fingers of land and all those little narrow, narrow passageways, the locals are perfectly equipped to know exactly where everything is, to know how to navigate, to have little networks of people hidden away in the woods. They could go grab some stuff on the high seas, go up a creek, unload really quickly, and have a little network of people to attack anyone that would follow them. And that's why pirating was extremely successful for a very long time in this area. And the Killigrews, Far from stopping it, just made sure that people bribed them to allow it to continue. So anytime anyone would have a complaint, they would just get a nice little bribe, perhaps wine was really popular, uh, and they would turn a blind eye to all of this. And they encouraged it and proliferated um, because of it. And in fact, the killer groups themselves were physically involved in piracy. And my favorite story um, involved Dame Mary. And Dame Mary lived uh, in the 16th century, and somewhere in the middle of the 16th century, Things were quite tense with the Catholics and the Protestants, or the emerging Protestants. And at that point, a Spanish ship came and uh, came into harbor and put down anchor, and for the night they were going to stay there. 
And of course, as a good English person, Dame Mary wanted to have nothing to do with these Spanish Catholics, and she wanted their stuff. Unfortunately, her man was not at home, and she had no other man, male servants, and so she took a group of her ladies, and they stormed the ship while the Spanish were at, at a pub. And so they held up whoever was left behind to guard the ship, and they took all of the stuff, and these ladies took it back and hid it in little baskets around the house. And apparently she was quite upset because it turned out that the hall was not all that great. It just had things like leather uh, and a little bit of wine and little pilings of metal. So nothing like what she was really wanting. And they really wanted things that they could sell and give away to give them status. So I keep mentioning wine was a really big thing. Wood is also excellent, really nice fabrics from abroad. So apparently she was unhappy with how this turned out. And the Spanish, of course, you would expect complained about this. <coughs> Luckily for Dame Mary, her husband was the person who was on the ju judiciary panel. And so, of course, she got off completely scot-free. And this is the sort of thing that was just happen all of the time. And this is really how Falmouth started off. The money that was in Falmouth was associated with things like this. <coughs> now, I mentioned that Dame Mary came from the 16th century. And this is the time of the Tudors. And you have um, some interesting Tudor influence around here in this area. So, of course, we know that Dennis Castle um, came into being in this time. This was Henry VIII who built this between 1539 and 1542. And the castle really had two purposes. One of them was to look out for pirates, because if it's okay for us to do piracy, but we don't want someone else taking our stuff. And we also want to protect our ships that are being followed by people who weren't pleased about having their things plundered. Um, and we also want to worry about neighboring countries that maybe want to initiate war. And Henry VIII was really paranoid about this. And in fact, his plan was to have four ships, uh, four ships, four <coughs> castles in the area that would guard the harbor and look out for other ships on the horizon. And the only two castles that were built were the one at Pendennis and at St. Mauls. And this castle is actually kind of interesting later on in time as well, because uh, when King Charles was overthrown, that was the very last place that surrendered um, to the the new troops that were coming in to take over. It was the place that his family fled to whenever they were on their way to safety elsewhere. So it was quite important um, in the history of the town. Now another thing that happened during this period was that Henry VIII killed off all of the people that had been learning in, in Penryn at this uh, Lasney College. And Penryn was really at that time much bigger than Falmouth. It was eclipsing Falmouth uh, for a while. And it was a center of learning as well as trade. And these monks and other religious people were really well respected. And they did not like the fact that Henry was reforming everything. And so they led something called the Prayer Book Rebellion, um, the religious folks in general. And these guys went to go take part. And King Henry had them slaughtered. And he had the college shut down. And that's one of the reasons that we're here today, is to, to kind of carry on that legacy of a center of learning being here. Now, Henry, of course, was eventually succeeded by his daughter after a little bit of other stuff in between. And we know that Elizabeth was really interested in maritime things. And so she knew that this was a really important era, area for that. And so she sent um, Sir Walter Raleigh down. At that time, we also had the Burley map being created, probably in association with that uh, journey. And this map is considered to be probably the first image that we have of Falmouth. So we do know that they thought it was at least important enough to kind of investigate and make a record of. Now Falmouth was officially incorporated in 1661 after there was some kind of feelers put out earlier in the century. It took them about 50 years to actually go from conceiving this to actually doing it. And that was really a, an amazing time because between 1661 and 1665, you suddenly go from having just a few fishermen living around to having a marketplace, having ale houses, having government areas, having churches. So it becomes, you know, not just a town in name, but definitely a town in practice as well. And in fact, in 1668, you also have the first Falmouth built ship being launched. And this is showing that, you know, from the very beginnings, people around here had the talent and the resources to build ships. And this was kind of a precursor of something that would happen a lot more in the future. The thing that really, I won't say put Falmouth on the map, but really kind of put the end to the rivalry between Penryn and Falmouth. And there was a rivalry because they were close and they were competing for resources and for people and for growth. 
Um, but Penryn was being kind of gradually silted up, which meant that it wasn't so good at doing all that maritime stuff, plus it no longer had the college. And the thing that really put the nail in the coffin is the fact that the packet service, service the Royal Mail Packet Service, was established here in 1688. I wanted to say 1688. Um, so it was established here, and this was extremely important. And the purpose of this was to deliver mail to Spain and to bring mail back from Spain. But very quickly it grew, and it wasn't just Spain anymore. It was the rest of Europe. It was out towards the Mediterranean. It was down and across to the New World, uh, to South America and North America. And this was really a huge thing for Falmouth. It employed tons of people, and it also made this the center of news. So the only place that had more news and knew more about the world at this time was London because a lot of ships would go straight to London if they could and deliver the mail there. But if they couldn't do that, and a lot of them couldn't because they had just come from across the ocean, they would land here and the news would be known to everyone in Falmouth before being taken up to London. So this was a really, really huge deal. And that service lasted until 1851. So it was here for quite a long time until it was finally sold off and moved elsewhere, um, kind of generally in this region. It was taken out of Cornwall, actually, I think. And when it was shut down in 1851, suddenly you've got hundreds of people that no longer have jobs. And this is uh, quite a scary thing, obviously, but the town planners at that time <coughs> wanted to make decisions to not just give those people jobs right then, but to give them jobs that would be perpetuated throughout the generations. So they really wanted to make some decisions for Falmouth that would last for a long time, and be really meaningful for the town. And so one of the things they decided to do was emphasize the seafood industry. And right now we tend to think of Falmouth as being a place that has seafood, but not where the seafood necessarily is collected. If you think about fish markets, you think about Newland, for example, or Padstow. But Falmouth actually always had quite a lot of fishing going on. And back in the day, there was uh, a sandbar where the docks used to be, or where the, sorry, where the docks are now. Um, and at the sandbar, the fishermen would come in and unload these massive amounts of fish that they would get, and they would put those on the train and, and train them up to London. So this was a really important source of, of seafood for the rest of the country. And so this picture right here uh, is a really old picture from like the early 1800s, I think. And that shows the fish market where it used to be. And basically, if you know where Superdrug is now, kind of that used to be a hotel, the Royal Hotel. And behind that, there was a, the fish market key. And so everyone used to come in and unload all of this stuff, and there were buildings associated with ice and with other fishermen's supplies and they would come and sell their wares there until people at the hotel complained that it smelled a bit bad and they moved it elsewhere. Um, it's now close to where the Waterman's Inn is, I think. Um, so this was something that was encouraged quite a lot and the oyster dredging as well. And in fact, we have still, we've got working ships that date back to this time, the 1860s or so, because oyster dredging is a really important thing in this area. And at that time, or shortly thereafter, um, as kind of the in industrialism started to spread, the town planners made rules that said you cannot do any kind of oyster dredging with um, these kind of new mechanical devices. And so they've always kind of kept the mechanics out of oyster dredging here in this area. And that's why we have the working boats, where you can only use boats that have sail power, and you can only do hand dredging and not um, any kind of mechanized dredging. And that was for the purpose of preserving the habitat and allowing people to do this for lots and lots of generations. However, the really big thing that was advocated in this area was the dogs. And this is actually something that dates back to about the 17th century, because this was the port all along. You always had ships coming in to do various sorts of trading. And the, at that time, the English military noticed that you had lots of people from other countries that would come in and do their graving here. And graving was where you're fixing, you're refitting and recalking and cleaning out a ship. And they thought, you know, these other countries are doing this a lot, and we should probably do this a lot if we want to have a competitive fleet as well. And so they advocated Falmouth as a place to do that. And um, so we have this history of having people who know how to make all the things that you need for a ship, and how to fit a ship with those things, how to fix ships that are already built. And that was something that they decided to really big up in the time after um, the packet service closed. And so they took all these experts and all this labor that was already here, and they decided to actually make an official, <coughs> gigantic dock system to facilitate lots more of that. 
And actually, this was originally planned for the Roseland Peninsula, and it would have been kind of a hideous blight on the area, but instead they decided to do a smaller version here in Falmouth. And these are historical pictures showing um, the early dock. And here you can see um, that's one of the really big ones where they, at that time, it would have had uh, a really nice giant ship of the day coming in for dry dock. Now, of course, ships are so massive that even uh, Falmouth can't really make space for them. We're the third largest natural harbor in the world, the biggest in the UK, the biggest in Western Europe, and yet even Falmouth can't make room for these ships. But what we can make room for in these facilities that we've had for quite a while is things like super yachts and ferries and some military vessels as well. And so that's what they eventually uh, started to specialize in. So this was put in at the site of that former sandbar. Obviously, it had some negative ecological consequences. There was a stream that used to dump out there, and they had to put it underground. And then when they built um, the luxury housing that's right there next to the dock, the people who built that didn't realize there was an underground creek, and so it flooded all of their foundations. So it's been kind of a, a difficult fit, but it has had huge economic impacts. And actually, even though we tend to not see a lot of the dock hands that much, Falmouth is still considered very much a working town because of the number of people that are associated with this industry. The docks is the second biggest non-government employer in Cornwall after Ginsters. <laughs> happening at a time when Falmouth is really modern. <coughs> and you might not think much about how modern Falmouth is today, but actually Cornwall was really at the cutting edge of things. We had lots of scientists and engineers living in this area for whatever reason. Um, Red Ruth was the first town, uh, the first house, it had the first house in the whole country that was lit by gaslight. Falmouth followed suit very quickly after and became the first town in the whole country to have been lit complete, completely by gaslight. So we were quite advanced at that time. Um, in 1863, we had the, the Truro to Falmouth train arriving. And this was really another huge step for the, the town. And it shows you how much infrastructure really matters. Because once you have the train linking us up with Truro and the rest of Cornwall, suddenly you've got lots of tourists coming in. We've been really inaccessible, inaccessible until that time. But the train makes everything possible. And these are pictures, actually. Uh, this is the dock. So the original train station here was the one that's out next to Falmouth Docks. Originally, they proposed to have the train go to the Green Bank Hotel. And that's because the original entrance to town uh, is up Old Hill. So you know where McDonald's is if you go down by the water. And there's that massive hill. So that's how everyone would have entered town. They would have gone up Old Hill, down Bassett and Beacon Street, and then onto the High Street. And then shortly after that, they finally did open up something uh, that went around the Green Bank, and so that would have been the second main entrance into town. And it wasn't until the 1920s that we had Dracaena Avenue, which I think probably most of us use today. And so when they built this train, what they wanted to do was take it to the Green Bank Hotel, which had stood there since the 1700s. Um, and actually, there was a, an ale house there since 1670. But luckily, um, someone just, well, luckily for me, because I live in this area, someone decided to send the train to the docks instead. And that was very smart because you could load it up with fish as well as with people, like I said. So that was really important for economics. Um, but it brought in lots and lots of people who could suddenly now access the town. And this was true not just in Falmouth, but actually the rest of Cornwall also. So suddenly you have lots of tourists at this time flooding the area. And here's Falmouth Hotel, which was opened in 1865. Uh, it was the first actually um, deliberately built hotel in the area. So the Green Bank was just an ale house that kind of grew into a place where you could stay. But the Falmouth Hotel was the first one that was built because of tourists. And they wanted it to be there for people who were coming in to take, um, take their health by the sea. So it was put right here. Um, and you can see the little, this is where we're all going to be snorkeling, by the way. Um, you can see the little road there still. So it's actually quite similar, but it looks incredibly different without that massive road right in front of the hotel. Another thing that happened at this time is that you've got a lot of uh, kind of forward-thinking people who realize that all this increasing urbanization is not so great for the psyche and for the health of people. And so they wanted to do a lot of stuff to make Falmouth look pretty and be nice as an experience. And this was amazing that the Victorians, the Edwardians, realized something that we have kind of forgotten and are now rediscovering, that it's really healthy to be outside. Uh, and when you're in the middle of a city, it's good to have a place to go that's not 
in an urban kind of building. And so you've got places like Queen Mary Garden um, and Swan Pool and the Gilling Dune area. So the bandstand was put in while they waited for the Princess Pavilions to be built. Uh, and you've got also the Kimberley Park. And all these things were happening in that kind of 1850 to 1915 kind of period. Uh, the Swan Pool thing is kind of interesting. I'll mention this a bit more specifically. Because this used to just be a lagoon, so it would flood periodically, and it was a real mess because, you know, when the waves got high enough, they'd go over the sandbar and flood into the pool. And this was not great for traffic, it was not great for recreation, because obviously it's a bit unpredictable, the waves come up and leave you stranded. And so in 1826, they installed a tunnel, and that tunnel is still there today, and that linked the pool and um, the, the beach area, and that meant with the tunnel that you never, you no longer have overflow going over the road and cutting you off. So you can actually build in an access point for people to walk around, to drive around, and all that water flow will go in the tunnel instead of over uh, instead. And so that's when this really became a recreational area and also a nature preserve eventually, because suddenly there was no longer this issue with the tides. Another big thing that happened. Um, which is not actually a high point like some of these other things, is that there was a huge fire in 1862. And this meant that about 40 businesses and homes were completely burnt out. About 400 people no longer had a home. And obviously that's not a good thing. But the, the silver lining here is that when they rebuilt this, they widened the street considerably. It had been really, really narrow and tight. And so they widened it because they realized at this time that this was going to be really important for the future of Falmouth, was to be able to have traffic coming in, cars, and well, at that time, for strong carriages, probably. And so they wanted to make sure that this was an area that was accessible to people. And other things that they did were kind of include buildings um, that were facilitating kind of growth and intellectual sorts of pursuits. So where we once had an area called Snow's Court, where you had people that were affiliated with the maritime industry, uh, these guys would, would live there and, and do some business there. They replaced that, and they put in St. George's well, cinema at the time. And when this was built, it was the place in the whole county, and it had like a thousand people that could fit in. And unfortunately, there was a fire there in the 1950s, and that's why we have all the little shops inside. And I saw someone mouth Club Eye, of course, yes. <laughs> as highly esteemed as the cinema once was. <laughs> so there were all sorts of things like this, and they would go in and take out what they kind of saw as slums, and they would replace them with things that the whole community could use. And, you know, that's not maybe the greatest thing ever, but it did put infrastructure here that was kind of facilitating this new face of Falmouth. And as a result of that, and this is actually something that happens throughout Cornwall at this period, you've got a lot of important people coming in and a lot of important kind of first steps being taken. Um, so here is, what is it, JMW, I forget the initials, but it, this is Turner, the painter, who in 1811 visited here and painted Falmouth and was considered one of the first people to recognize the importance of the Cornish light and to paint Falmouth in that beautiful Cornish light. Um, and it is quite a nice painting. Um, Daphne de Maurier, we all know, we're standing in her building. Um, Peter Landry. <coughs> this is Kenneth Graham. Everyone knows Kenneth Graham, saying probably from The Wind and the Willows. He stayed at the Green Bank Hotel and during this time there wrote sections of The Wind and the Willows. Um, some people think that maybe he was inspired to write those characters in those places because of uh, the lovely scenery along the Penryn River. You might all snicker at that, but actually at the time it was very lovely scenery. Um, so he wrote, he wrote that book as a series of letters to his son and he wrote two major chunks of those letters here in Falmouth itself. Another thing that happened was he had a school of art opening, and this was a really big deal at the time. So in 1896, there were these classes, these art classes that were being offered on the moor. And by 1902, you actually had the institution being founded. And of course, it grew into uh, the Falmouth College of Arts and then Falmouth University as it is today. You also had an observatory being built. The first one came in. 1867 or something like that, and it was one of only seven such facilities in the whole country. And then a second one replaced it in 1885 and was one of only four in the country. So Falmouth was really on the map in terms of being a place where you had scientists and intellectual types. Cornwall at the time, that was the area where we had um, people developing steam engines and other sorts of really important technology to get uh, the minerals out and mining. And so we did have a lot of scientific stuff going on here. 
And that's reflected in the Royal Cornwall Polytechnic, which is the first and only polytechnic in the country, apparently. Um, this was founded by the two of the Fox sisters. And the Foxes are another really important uh, family in Falmouth's history. And these guys founded the, the poly, as it's now known, to facilitate intellectual pursuits in the area. And it's still going and still doing a lot of stuff that combines both art and science. And finally, the last kind of big benefit of growth I want to highlight is the fact that, you know, a lot of this stuff was associated with, and still is associated with, our placement right here on the coast. And I don't want to ignore that by going um, off on all these kind of terrestrial tangents. So the, the lifeguard institute and facilities that were established here in the 1860s are still going strong today. And in fact, we're not only the southwesterly most uh, location in the UK, we also service lots of places internationally when they have emergencies because the people here are trained in a particular way and have access to uh, these countries. And so at a moment's notice, they are often deployed off to really far-flung locations to help out. So this is a real contribution that Falmouth makes to the rest of the world. Uh, because of our location, we do get lots of visitors and have all along during really important uh, phases of events. So for example, the HMS Pickle, my favorite name ever of a boat, uh, landed here in 1805 to spread word that Admiral Nelson had been killed. In 1836, you've got uh, the Beagle landing here with Darwin. You've got uh, Mandry's Falmouth to Falmouth uh, trip from Falmouth, Massachusetts, Massachusetts to Falmouth uh, in England. And this was done in a little tiny boat at the drop of a hat at the last minute. He switched into a little dinghy and he made it all the way across the ocean and that was kind of a groundbreaking trip. And then you had the two <coughs> navigations in this, what, 68, 69. There was a whole year spent traveling around the globe. And then another one in 2007 by Ellen and Arthur. And both of these started and finished in Falmouth. So this is a really important place for maritime activities and for kind of starting off or receiving these big uh, journeys. Now, of course, there are also some drawbacks to all of this growth and putting yourself on a map. And because Falmouth had become such a huge harbor, it drew the attention of the Germans, as you might expect. Uh, and actually, the English did anticipate this, and they set up a really huge submarine network out in the Falmouth Harbor, waiting in case the Germans did come to attack. And despite this, there is what I think must be a fallacious story, that the Germans managed to get a boat into the middle of the harbor, right in the center of town. A few soldiers came out, got, made their way up into town, attacked the cinema, ran back to the submarine, and <laughs> took off again. And I cannot imagine why on earth that would happen, except that the cinema was the first thing that they saw and the first thing they could attack before getting attacked themselves. I don't know. But supposedly that happened. We know that for sure they did bomb the docks in 1940, and this resulted in uh, three vessels being sunk and six people being killed. And obviously that was quite catastrophic. But we did get some revenge uh, in 1942 because Spalman played an important role in Operation Chariot, which was important in defending um, saint Nazar and France. And that was what led to the sinking of the Bismarck, the kind of turning of the ties in many ways. And so Falmouth was actually really active in World War II and played a really important role, not only in servicing the ships then, but also afterwards when they were rebuilding the, the Navy and trying to fix everything. Falmouth played a really integral role in getting uh, the military kind of back on its feet. Other costs are less obvious, um, and I think actually kind of more interesting. So I mentioned the Royal Hotel. Here it is. Uh, here it is today, super drug. Um, you know, you can kind of compare what it looked like then and see what it looks like now. And it's not quite the same feel. Um, so some of the aesthetics of the town are not quite what they used to be. Another thing that's really amazing to me is how it's changed, uh, all this modernization has changed the nature of the town, by which I literally mean nature, not aspect. Um, so here, this is Grove Place, and here it is Grove Place today, you can see on the views west. Um, so the parking lot that's there now is on, in the place of what actually used to be a mud flat. And here it is at high tide, and you can see the water is going almost, well basically up to the road. And that was a wall that was built there to retain it, so it would have gone even further and there would have been marshes there originally. 
But what used to happen here at low tide is that the local fishermen would bring their boats up and fix everything uh, and then go back out to sea. And so all of this was lost when they put in the, the parking lot instead and the little Tesco and the Maritime Museum and all of that sort of thing in that area. And of course, those can have big consequences if you get rid of a marsh, if you get rid of that normal tidal flow, that's going to change a whole lot about the dynamics. And now in that area, you've got all the water underground, underneath the key, which may or may not be great, especially when you think about um, tidal changes as uh, climate, the climate continues to change. Now, contemporary Falmouth is a big mixture of things that really draw on what it used to be. And it's really just kind of adding in more stuff and, and increasing the activity of all those things that used to happen. So everything I've mentioned from the past, Falmouth still does in some way or another. Uh, you know, we've got the docks that are really huge right now. We've got yachting and boating. This is considered one of the best places in all of Europe to do boating because of the channels and how uh, deep they are and how much access they provide. We've got art. So the art gallery that's next to the library is considered to be a very important one in all of England because of the, the pieces that it contains. It's just a little tiny free library in the middle of our <coughs> uh, The wildlife, of course, the universities, the oysters, the oyster festivals, and all the other seafood that's around. Of course, the tourism, and a really big thing that's being initiated recently is to increase tourism <coughs> by allowing in these giant boats. Uh, that have people on cruises, and that's one of the reasons why they want to do dredging, is to facilitate even more of this. Uh, just since the time that I've been here, we suddenly have some of these coming almost every day for weeks on end, and that never happened when I first arrived. So it's really becoming very focused on tourism here in town. And people have always realized that the reason that all this tourism is happening is because of the environment. In Cornwall, we get something like 20 million visitors a year, um, just under that. And those visitors bring in about two billion doll, uh, pounds, sorry, wrong currency. Um, and this is obviously extremely important, and they've done surveys of these people and found out that the majority of them come because of the loveliness of the habitat. They come because it's pretty and because there are beaches. And people really early on in this area have realized that you've got to maintain that loveliness if you want to maintain those tourists. And so, We've got these areas of outstanding natural beauty um, flanking us. You've got one on the Fowl River in the estuary, and you've got one in the Lizard. Uh, you've got groups that are involved in conservation efforts. So this poor little guy was uh, injured during that awful oil spill over the winter. You've got people that are interested in the mammals, and they keep a lookout for them and tally all this information to find out how we're interacting with them, how our boat traffic is affecting them, how the fishing is affecting them. Uh, you've, you've got these networks of people that are working on the strandings and trying to help wildlife. And even locally here in Falmouth, we've got something uh, that's all about promoting green tourism. You can keep track of whether your favorite businesses are involved in this. So there is a whole lot of emphasis in preserving the environment, even uh, while we use it. But all the same, we do have a lot of people in Cornwall. Cornwall is the fastest growing area in the nation. And Falmouth is growing along with the rest of Cornwall. You can see here this massive uh, change. So there was a bit of a dip in the 70s, but pretty much ever since these censuses began, there has been an increase. And by 70s, by the way, I should say, 1870s. Um, so we've had this massive increase in the population here. And you know, the question is, where are we going to put all these people? How are we going to cram us all in? Where are we going to get our energy? Where are we going to get our food? What are we going to do when climate change has an impact on the coastal habitat? Uh, so these are issues that people are really struggling with here in Falmouth and also in Cornwall and you know, everywhere else as well. And that, that series of questions and concerns is really where I want to leave you because that's what this event is all about. And hopefully by seeing where we started off and how the environment has kind of shaped where we are today, you can kind of get um, your teeth into the idea of, of why we need to balance growth and conservation and, and maybe how that can be done. Yeah,